Glory be to God. Oh, are you not clapping for God? Oh. God is the one working through us. We don't own ourselves. He has the talent through us. And we are praising him at this moment. That means this program is going to be a successful one. One more clap for God Almighty. God, God loves us so much. Sometimes in this world, it's so strange. You have your own friends, your own brothers. They always smile with you as if they love you. But the back of their mind is something different. It's only God who knows our secrets. We're finishing on the one That's when I come on you now. We finishing on the one three qua. That's when I come on the eighteen tomorrow. We finishing on the one three qua. That's when I come on the eighteen tomorrow. Ah, oh, 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 ah, ah. We're finishing. Ah, on the one street corner, that's when I come and move the air. Ain't it too much? We're finishing. Chaka chaka chaka. On the one street corner, that's when I come and move the air. Ain't it too much? Prof, Akwamba, Akwabu. Prof, Akwamba, Akwamba. E mo wale mo money yo. E juma di a wey magana. Aquaba, Aquabo, 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 Aquabo. We're finishing. On the one street corner, that's when I come and move the air. Eight to two more, we're finishing. Chaka chaka. On the one street corner, that's when I come and move the air. Eight. Anna me boy, we're finishing. On the one street corner, that's when I come and move the air. Eight to two more, we're finishing. On the one street corner, that's when I come and move the air. Eight to two more. I only pay you through the power to the command. I only pay you through the power to the command. I only pay you through the power to the command. I only pay you through the power to the command. I only pay you through the power to the command. I only pay you through the power to the command. I only pay you through the power to the command. I only pay you through the pack of I only pay you cry. I only pay you through the pack now. I only pay you. I only pay you I only pay you cry. I only pay you through the power. I only pay you cry. I only pay you through the power. I only pay you cry. I.
This song is a special song to you, our speaker. It's a Nigerian traditional song, Baramumbe, Yoruba song. Baramumbe. Etumo
Thank you. I believe you are enjoying inside. The name of the band is called Hewale Sounds. Been with CDD for the past 25 years. That tells the bond between the two. We love you, CDD. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The Governing Board, Senior Fellows, CDD, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I want to hear the welcome. <laughs> well, we'll start with a brief prayer. Uh, I won't bore you too much asking you to stand Good evening, all ladies and gentlemen. The best way we know how. The Governing Board, Senior so if you may, please, CDD, if you may, we bow down our heads guests, and then we say a brief prayer. And gentlemen, Thank you, Lord, welcome. for this beautiful event welcome. and the opportunity to influence our <laughs> well, society we'll start with a brief prayer. positively. Uh, I won't bore you too we pray, much Lord, asking you to stand like the Lord with this, and the best way we know how. Be the overlord as we initiate decisions So if you may, for please, if you may, we bow down today. our heads and then we say a brief Bind. prayer. And Thank you, Lord. For this beautiful event this and, and the opportunity to we influence our in society. Amen. Positive. This is the 17th Lord Kronti, like the Kronti and Akamu Quadrant. And this year the overlord is anchored as we initiate on the theme, decisions the evolution for the collective of the civic space today. in modern Find Africa democracy. I am particularly excited interest. about it. If you miss this our Twitter more, spaces, ask you have an opportunity to catch up. Amen. Amen. This is the 17th, and we know that this is the 17th lecture. lecture. Over the period, we started in March 20, 2005, I should say, the Kontini Akamu Lecture 
is the centers, that's the CDD's flagship annual public lecture on democracy and governance. It is one of the center's initiatives aimed towards bridging the gap between reflection, research, and analysis on one hand, and pro-democracy and good governance advocacy on the other. Over the period, like I said, the lecture which is dubbed Konti Miyakomu, after the Akan Edunkra symbol, that best represents democracy, duality of the essence of life and interdependence. The symbol also encapsulates a system of decentralized political authority with different branches of government complementing and also checking each other. Over the period, we've had the likes, which is the maiden edition in 2005. We've had Professor Larry Diamond, a senior fellow of the Hoover Institution of Stanford University, USA, and he spoke on democracy and development all the way to our 20th anniversary, where we saw Professor Jima Bwedi, our very own, the board chair of the Afrobarometer Network, speaking on making democracy work for the people reflections. So we had our 16th, 17th, and our very own, my brother, Bernard Avle, speaking on radio, rulers, and ruled in the Fourth Republic, setting the tone nicely for this evening's lecture, which is the 17th. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a good time to make welcome the executive director of CDD Ghana, Professor H. Kwesi Prempe, to set the tone for the welcome address. We want to hear your applause, please. Good evening, honorables, Distinguished guests, fellow Ghanaians. <laughs> On behalf of the board, management and staff of Ghana Center for Democratic Development, CDD Ghana, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this, the 17th annual Kontini Akomu Lecture. To those newborns who may be unfamiliar with the work of CDD Ghana, the center is a non-governmental, non-partisan, not-for-profit civil society organization that has been working since 1998 to promote democracy, good governance, and inclusive development in Ghana and the rest of Africa. Through research, analysis, education, advocacy, and policy, and citizen engagement, the center works in five broad thematic areas, political and constitutional governance, social inclusion and equity, economic governance, justice, peace and security, and civil society and media strengthening. CDD Ghana also runs a number of important projects and initiatives, prominent among which are the Coalition of Domestic Election Observers, CODEO, a diverse network of Ghanaian civic and professional organizations that has observed every one of Ghana's elections since the 2000 elections, including local level, local government elections and by-elections. There is also the Afrobarometer, a pan-African survey network that collects, analyzes, and disseminates public opinion data on political and socio-economic issues, developments, and trends in more than 35 African countries, and of which CDD Ghana is a founding core partner for West Africa and North Africa, as well as the national partner for Ghana. In September of this year, CDD Ghana deepened its African footprint by leading the formation of the West African Democracy Solidarity Network, WADEMOS, a transnational democracy solidarity network bringing together over 30 civil, civic, civic organizations and civil society organizations within the 16 countries of ECOWAS. Now a word about the Kronzini Akwamu lecture for which we are gathered here this evening. 
Over a decade and a half ago, the Kronti and Akwamu annual lecture was launched as the flagship democracy and governance lecture of CDD Ghana. The lecture takes its name from the Akan Edikran symbol, Kronti Akwamu, the Edikran symbol that offers the best homegrown representation of a political system of popular democracy, decentralized or deconcentrated political authority in which different components of state and society work to complement but also to check each other. This for us is from our own traditional setting emblematic of what it is that democracy and governance must represent. The lecture features prominent democracy practitioners, scholars and activists, both local and foreign, whose work focuses on various aspects or dimensions of democracy building and strengthening. As already mentioned, the maiden lecture was in March 2005, and in the years since, we have had many distinguished Ghanaians and non ghanaians take the lectern here in Accra at various locations to give us their various insights on democracy and governance. Past speakers have included the late Nobel Prize, Nobel Peace Prize laureate and former UN Secretary General, our very own Kofi Annan, the, former speak, the late uh, former Speaker of Parliament, the Right Honorable Peter Alajete, the Executive Director of African Women Development Fund, Ms. BC, Mrs. BC Adeleye Fayemi, the late Ghanaian jurist and elder statesman, Justice VC RAC Krab, uh, former chair of the Ghana Electoral Commission, Dr. Kweju Afarijan, and I see two former, uh, two of our past speakers here, one of whom is chairing today's event in the person of Professor Kwame Kakari and Professor Techua Neno. Other speakers of note are Mr. Kweku Bako, a journalist, and former commissioner of the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Justice Emil Short. This year's lecture, the 17th since um, its launch, is titled The Evolution of Civic Space in Modern African Democracy. This topic is timely as the world, including our sub-region, experiences the related phenomena of authoritarian resurgence, democratic backsliding, and a shrinking civic space. These developments, which have grown in intensity since the COVID-19 pandemic, have placed many democratic projects and democracy activists at risk. In the Civic, Civicus 2020 report, it's, it's noted that 87% of the world's population now live in countries rated as closed, repressed, or obstructed. Even before the pandemic, Freedom House had reported 14 continuous years of decline in protection of political and civil, civic rights globally. Democracy then is in recession across the world and civic spaces are increasingly shrinking in countries across, across the globe in countries of divergent uh, income spectrum, new and old democracies alike. These worrying trends include restrictions or disruption of peaceful protests, regulation, needless regulation aimed at shifting power from civic to political actors, digital closure and surveillance, anti-NGO bills and restrictive laws, unlawful arrest and detention of activists and the like. I will leave it to our distinguished speaker for this evening to tell the rest of the story. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I would like to place on record the profound gratitude of CDD Ghana to Stambik Bank, KPMG, the Multimedia Group, Unique Image Limited, and Bell Aqua Mineral Water for partnering with us to host this 17th edition of the Kronti Niakwamu Lecture. But before I retire to my seat, it is also my pleasure and duty to introduce to you our chairperson for today's event. A long-standing friend of the center and a supporter of our activities over the years, Professor Kwame Kakari retired from the University of Ghana in 2015 after 30 distinguished years of service, rising to the position of Associate Professor of Journalism and Communication Studies. During this period, he also served briefly as Director General of the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation from 1982 to 1984. Africa. This culminate, culminated in its founding and managing the Media Foundation for West Africa, a press freedom and freedom of expression advocacy, non-profit, non-governmental organization based in Accra, but serving the entire West Africa region. He led the Media Foundation from 1997 to 2000, when he transitioned the organization to its new and current leadership. The Media Foundation has, has become well known for its pioneering role, especially in these times of civic, uh, shrinking civil space, trying to police and monitor the civic and media uh, landscape across West Africa. Professor Kwame Kakari has served on many international and local boards and committees that are dedicated to the promotion of policies and institutions for the advancement of media development and freedom. In Ghana, we know him for, we also know him for his service on the National Media Commission as member and as chair of the board of directors of the Gra Graphic Communications Group Limited. He has participated in a number of civil society coalitions, including in partnership with CDD Ghana, to promote democratic media regulation and legislation, such as the Right to Freedom of Information Act and the yet to be passed broadcasting bill. Professor Kwame Kakari is currently lecturer in communication studies at the privately owned Wisconsin International University College in Accra. It is my distinguished honor, ladies and gentlemen, to invite our chair, Professor Kwame Kakari, to the lecture. Thank you. Good evening. <coughs> Thank you very much, <coughs> Professor Prempe. I want to give a special good evening and welcome to Professor Greenstreet. It's a great honor to have you in, at an event like this. It keeps reminding us. <laughs> keeps reminding us of our responsibility to keep doing what is right for our society. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I want to also thank Professor Juma uh, the CDD Board and Management for giving me this really important function. As Professor Prempe has already said, the civic space in Africa today uh, is 
in some reversal, going through some difficulties. And therefore, the topic today is extremely relevant, and I hope that we will pay close attention to the issues raised by the lecturer and then also continue the discussions because it's at the center, at the core of our, the health of our democracy, both in Ghana and elsewhere on our continent. The Krontini Akwemu lectures have become uh, a, a kind of civil society academy, if I may put it that way, for want of a better uh, expression, of reflections on critical national public issues. The lectures, in a sense, sum up the activist interventions of the CDD in Ghana's public affairs issues. And we want to thank them for keeping the lectures going all these years. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pride and humility that I wholeheartedly accept the offer to chair this year's lecture. And as I've said, let us pay close attention and hope that we'll continue the discussions, the debates, uh, for as long as we still have some space to keep discussing these critical issues and ensure that the space doesn't close completely. Because we've gone through periods, we all know, where there was no space at all and had to keep fighting so hard that we lost so many of our citizens in the process. I believe we all have a duty to ensure that the space we have, the little space we have, should not, con should not close completely. We should try and keep it opening. We should keep it opening until whoever is holding it back gets tired and falls down. Thank you very much. Once again, you can do it better for our Professor Chair. Thank you so much for accepting to do this. There's another admonishment for all of us to receive tonight's lecture, the 17th Kunti and Okomu Lecture, with all our hearts, minds, body, and soul, and all that you can, so that we can keep the civic space open. So at this point, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors once again. This lecture is put together by CDD, the Center for Democratic Development Ghana, and proudly supported by some big bank, it can be, they say. We have KPMG for your auditing, taxing, advisory services to address your complex business needs. Look no further than KPMG. We have the multimedia group. They have, they have empowering people with great brands like Joy News, Joy FM. We have MyJoyOnline.com amongst others, which is independent, fearless, and credible journalism. We have a unique image. Everything printing, look no further than Unique Image Limited and Bell Aqua Mineral Water. At this point, with this admonition, it's time to reflect, time to also forget all the problems of the day and problems to come when you get home. Also time to be happy and not worry and let it all go as we prepare for this lecture. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Hewal Sounds. With a round of applause, please.
sounds once again let's hear it for them remember we are live on the joy news channel we are also live on joy 99.7 fm also myjoyonline.com and our hashtags for tonight is hashtag crony 2022 also hashtag open civic spaces you can also find us on linkedin at cdd ghana we are on instagram and facebook at cdd ghana we are on Twitter, like they say, at CDD Ghana. We are on Flickr also, at CDD Ghana. Our website is www.cddghana.org. And CDD, what we stand for is inclusiveness, independence, integrity, and excellence, just like multimedia group, independent, fearless, and credible. And before I introduce back to the podium, our chairperson for this event to introduce our speaker. I'm looking forward to this particular lecture tonight. If there's nobody here that she's about to speak to, she's speaking to me. So I am open for this. I want to keep the civic spaces open. But please let me introduce, in no particular order, let's just acknowledge some guests amongst us this evening. In no particular order. Once again, I'll start with Professor Green Street. Let's hear it for her once again with a round of applause. We also have Professor Jima Buedi in our midst. We have Professor Emmanuel Akwete with IDEG in our midst. We also have Alfred Chiayabua, is the Deputy Attorney General in our midst. Please, let's hear it for him. We have Prophet Gordon Kise in our midst as well. We have Professor Techua May also in our midst. Please, let's hear it for her once again. Also with us, I have Alaji Tanko with Star Ghana. Where are you, Alaji Tanko? Okay, welcome. We also have Ambassador Chega. It's a senior fellow CDD. Please give us a wave. Good to see you. We also have Nanaya Jantwa in our midst. Hello. We also have Bridget Jogbenuku, our president in waiting. Welcome. <laughs> I would acknowledge as we go on. So it's a good time to introduce back to the podium, to introduce our speaker for this evening, Professor Kakari, please. You can do it better. Before we came here to the room, Professor Greenstreet made a, a, a very useful comment congratulating the CDD for bringing uh, another speaker who is not from Ghana. And I think that it's a plus for the CDD to help us all reflect on uh, with the help of other scholars and activists from other parts of our continent and in the world. Our speaker tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is a Nigerian. <clears throat> Her name is Idayat Hassan, and she's the director of the Center for Democracy and Development, CDD, 
which is based in Abuja, and it's a policy advocacy and research organization that focuses on deepening democracy and development in West Africa. Prior to becoming the director, uh, Idayat had been, prior to become, uh, becoming director of the organization, Idayat was a senior program officer and a deputy regional coordinator with the movement against corruption in Nigeria. Now, for a young woman to be fighting corruption in Nigeria, you can, you can imagine the strength of will. I remember when a former accountant general, was it accountant general Domolovo? Auditor general. He once said that if you want to fight corruption, corruption will fight you back. Maybe another time, Idayat might tell us how she fought corruption and how she resisted the blues of corruption fighting her. Maybe another time. Idayat is a lawyer and has held fellowships in universities across Europe and the United States. Her interests span democracy, peace and security, transitional justice, and information and communications technology for development in West Africa. As director of the CDD West Africa, she has strengthened its position as a civic tech leader with a portfolio of projects, including analysis of the nexus between social media platforms, election processes, and electoral outcomes, using an app to identify electoral fraud and analyzing the use of personal data in political campaigning in Nigeria. In other words, she's worked to use modern technology in ensuring or promoting transparency in, elect in elections. Her work notably saw the CDD move from being unranked in 2013 to rising to the 11th position out of 94 think tanks in sub-Sahara Africa in 2020 by the University of Pennsylvania. Her expertise in the civil and democratic space in West Africa has been recognized and led to her membership of many reputable committees. She sits on the board of the Nigerian National Human Rights Commission and was recently added as a member of the National Peace Committee in Nigeria, made up of prominent citizens charged with maintaining peace during Nigeria's election period. Her insights have been utilized by security agencies, resulting in her involvement in the Nigerian Army's Operation Safe Corridor from its inception. Idayat has provided conceptual clarity on the Boko Haram phenomenon during its heydays, presenting analysis of the group's motives and methods at conferences in Nigeria and internationally. Idayat has been instrumental in several major projects, including the CDD's efforts to lead the fight against fake news, misinformation, and disinformation. This has led to partnerships with regional and international organizations, as well as domestic partners, to handle advocacy efforts and organize media training for, the, for journalists and fact checkers. Her work has also been at the heart of efforts to strengthen anti-corruption agencies and their capacity to check errant politicians and participants. A wealth of experience in the election landscape has seen the CDD become a valued partner of election management bodies in the West Africa region with an active election observer network in Nigeria. Our speaker, ladies and gentlemen, regularly appears in international and local media as an expert on the region and is regularly quoted in the BBC China Central Television, Radio France International, Voice of America, Bloomberg, Washington Post, Financial Times, The Economist, The Guardian, and Dutch Vela. She's also well published in academic journals 
and development-focused platforms and is actively sought after for her opinions in, commis in commissioned and solicited uh, write-ups. She recently co-edited What's Up in Everyday Life in West Africa, Beyond Fake News, with Jamie Hitchin, a book that showcases the growing impact of social media in the social politics of the region. Hidayat holds degrees from Lagos State University and the European Academy of Legal Theory, Brussels, and has been called to the Nigerian Bar. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the sister from Nigeria we are going to listen to. The wealth of experience she has is so much that you wonder how in such a young life all, this, all these activities have been accumulated. This is testimony that she is qualified to talk to us about the topic on the civic space in our continent today. And ladies and gentlemen, I am happy to introduce to you Hidayat Hassan from the CDD in Abuja. So, Hidayat, your audience, audience, Hidayat. Thank you very much. Only I'm not a Nigerian, but I'm also back home here in Accra. My home is just a few kilometers away in Koforidua, so it's home. It's not um, out of home. Having parents who were born in Ghana and half of my family based here in Ghana as well. So it's home for me, and I'm happy to be home. And I'm actually very honored that colleagues at the CDD Ghana have deemed it fit to invite me for this lecture. I think we are the two CDDs. We are twin in a pod, and we are partners in progress. And I've actually enjoyed working with CDD this last couple of years since I became the director, uh, which talks a lot really about also mentorship and how um, solidarity really matters. Even when Professor Boadi was there, uh, executive director, when you look at the age difference, like eight years ago, just imagine what an diet will look like, the kind of support I got, the kind of welcome actually did make a difference and also helped in terms of shaping who I have actually become today, really. So I'm very happy to be speaking on this platform and to be having this audience today. And most of the things that I'll actually be speaking on will be really not, I wouldn't go really theoretical. I think that's a part of the paper because I'm sure CDD Ghana will judge me if I write without a theoretical framework. But really, from my wealth of experience working on democracy, not just in Nigeria, but majorly across the West African region, adding the Sahel of Chad um, and Co to it. So I would really like to share my experiences and see how we can actually move forward. Uh, from here. I know that for us in Africa, civil society has progressed this last couple of years. And fundamentally enough, it's not just the English-speaking West Africa that we have had the emergence or even the proliferation of civic movement. In Francophone West Africa, almost on a daily basis, civil society has springing up, which is actually a positive that we should actually look at. And they are doing different things beyond most of us promoting democracy. They are also service providers. In COVID, they were willingly and available to provide services even while governments are still grappling with what and how they can actually deal with this pandemic. We have become very active and visible in the public fair. In fact, back home, when things are happening and we are not making comments, people will say, Idiot, what are we going to tell the government? What is happening? Why are you people not complaining? We have become the barometer where the average citizens actually gauge democracy in their country. But in spite of this, 
we still have challenges. And, uh, but challenges do not operate in a vacuum. Also, we have to understand that civil society itself has evolved from the pre-independence movements or civil society groups, where we have the nationalist movement, or we even have some organized as women groups who worked and articulated to ensure that we have independence in our country. From there, we moved to civil society organizations who were like anti-apartheid movement, like the CDD where I work, who established in 1997 in London by a group of exiles whose ambition at that point in time was to ensure that military rule is over on the continent. And from that, most of these movements or civic group became democracy sustenance group at every point in time. We are watching, we are ensuring that we are helping to nurture this democracy such that since 2000, this will represent like how many years, like 23 um, years or 22 of unbroken democracy um, in Ghana, talking in terms of the elections in Nigeria is another 22 years. I think I'm wrong with my Ghana figure, but for Nigeria it's like 22 years of unbroken democracy, the longest we have actually witnessed on the continent and the same across West Africa is something that we have continually seen. And I really think that for us here, there are lots of groups to actually celebrate from the Institute for Economic Affairs, the Ghana Center for Democracy and Development who have provided this platform, HIDEG itself, to the Sierra Leone CGD, and of course the Burkina, um, the Sierra Leone CGG, and the Burkina CGD and of course the Nigerian-based CDD, all are civil society in the same class, born almost the same time and with the same um, mission and objective. And today they continue to exist, they continue to stand strong and are even examples of what civil society should be with the transition that have actually occurred in most of this um, organization itself. But around the end of the 2010s, by 2012, we had another form of what we call civil society, and which I have labeled the grievance, um, the grievance uh, driven civil society a la movement. Because what we've always known are civil society who are multi layered, either issue driven or service oriented. So we are the issue driven one. Working on, working on elections, transparency and accountability, um, social justice, anti-corruption. But there are also service um, providers who are in all communities working and have even become a government, an alternative government on this continent in West Africa, providing services to the citizenry where the government are had in hard to reach areas. But all of a sudden we had by the grievance-driven civil society, um, also called social movement. And I think this is, of course, uh, interesting because they have done a lot of positive things, like we've seen with the Yaname in 2012 in Senegal, amongst others. But despite this notable achievement, there are challenges that we really have to lay our hands on itself. And some of this is not just what we talk about. Most of the time we talk about, yes, the return of the military era, we talk about the shrinking civic space. We often do not mention that the action of uncivil actors, such as non-state armed actors, like the insurgents operating in the nooks and crannies of West Africa and the Sahel, are also contributing to some of the challenges that we are facing, and in one way or the other, they are disproportionately affecting the civic um, space on the continent um, itself. And while I've said it theoretically, I'm going to skip all those uh, uh, dots um, to, to just talk about the fact that civil society is nothing new. I think for us in West Africa, it started appearing uh, in the literature of IMF and World Bank since the 1980s and the 1990s itself. 
and of course, uh, but broadly for me, I'm defining civil society in West Africa from the point of view of a liberal, voluntary, multi-community association recognized and organized, of course, around issues by in the liberal democratic states. And here they include trade union, the traditional chiefdom, religious communities, human rights defense group, not-for-profit think tanks like us, hum, uh, governance, activists, and even cooperative society, as broadly and expansive as possible. We have to start thinking of us that uh, way, and they continue to operate in different ways. I've earlier talked about the issue advocates and operation service um, providers as very, very important uh, sets of people uh, that we often deal with. And uh, but an important session of civic, civil society in West Africa are the grievance-driven groups, which are becoming new and bigger, really now. They are political actors, they are young activists, they are minority groups. They often join or form CSOs as an alternative to joining political party, be it opposition or ruling party. And amongst this group, we have professionals, some with certain ideological alignments, who want to experiment positive social transformation differently and outside the confines of the state apparatus itself. And they are beginning to dominate the landscape. When you look at 2011 in Senegal again, it wasn't just actors like ourselves. I think at that level, many people, maybe Emmanuel Akwete would have joined them to be protesting in Dakar. But what is important was the Senegalese rap musician, professors, journalists, and students came together and created the Yanama We Are Fed Up movement to counter what the movement leaders perceived as a perversion of the Senegalese political state space characterized by poor governance, corruption, political clientelism, financial scandals, and impunity at, at the head of the state in the cost of a rising cost of living and uncertainty. And similarly, we had the La Lucha in DRC Congo, Imagine at the same time, all in search for the fight for justice. In 2014, we had Ballet Citoyen, um, the citizens boom. We were able to effectively mobilize youth and women to house the 27 year long dictator, Blaise Kampori. This contribution has really aided a lot when it comes to democratic consolidation in West Africa itself. And what I really want to underpin here is that, looking at it from the beginning, when we were more of fighting for independence, till when we became democracy sustenance civic actors, and to now grievance driven, at every point in time, the evolution of civil society and civic space is reflective of the major political events in the region. So it's not out of place. It is what happened, what is happening, that we are actually responding to uh, and at every point in time. So the civic space and political transformation are co-dependent products in our West African democracy itself. And we are often boosted by political crisis. So I think that's beginning to charge you in terms of what do we and, do, and how do we do this. And I will quickly mention some of the positives we have done before I start looking at what I, where we had to go and where I think we should actually be going. I think we have done very well when it comes to the area of constitutional reform across the 15 ECOWAS countries. There were hardly any opportunity, you are talking in terms of constitutional changes, that civil society have not contributed to hit. I remember in 2015, at a point in time, we had like six countries effecting constitutional changes, which we actually, which was basically to either elongate the lives of administration or to benefit them. But together as a collective, we came together, acting nationally and regionally, and we were able to quash 
and bringing positives on that dimension, uh, in that area. In almost all the 15 countries, we do have Freedom of Information Act in place. And that's also a positive for civil society, as well as our anti-corruption effort with even collaboration worldwide when you are talking in terms of the Panama Papers and everything that we are seeing. So we are not just working nationally, we are working regionally and we are working internationally here. And I think election monitoring is one of my favorites when I look at what CODEO actually does uh, in the region. I say that they are like first among equals when it comes to the way as a collective they have been able to organize to observe elections. During the 2016 elections, all of us were busy rushing to Kofi Annan to listen to Cordill to tell us who had actually won the elections. That is the extent of legitimacy we have actually been able to build in this work that we do. And even when you take, for instance, the Senegal 2019 elections, I'm very sorry, I'm very biased towards where our Francophone uh, politics actually the 2019 elections are in Senegal as well. There were attempts by people to ask people to even boycott the votes. They shouldn't go out and vote. But a group of civil society organized as a two jam, which is a peace space, an association or what it's wall of people of the street. At the end of the day, they were still able to mobilize and get like 66% of the people to register and be on the vote. So what kind of positives can we start thinking of other than that in terms of what we have done? And in public health, when you look at polio eradication, you look at HIV, and even the COVID-19 pandemic, how the civic actors stepped in, you will see that we have actually made progress and we would continue to make progress. And I think one important factor that might not look so progressive, but which is still progressive is that we saw civil society organize to even push, organize resistance in what they call to the remnants of the old world order in the Francophone zone in a drive to reject the French CEFA itself. It was headed by civil society group from Mali, Benin, Burkina Faso, just to name a few. And today, ECOWAS is talking about a common ECOWAS con currency. Even if it remains an elusive dream, we still have the hope that one day there will still be that echo. And these, of course, are things that civil society have actually been able to do. But this, my paper, we look at very, um, given the background, we look at two very important uh, key issues. The external factors that is militating against the civic space, while also looking at the internal factors which are hacking or the responsibility lies on us as civic actors to promote itself. When we look at these um, external actors, uh, external factors really, I think the first we will start thinking about is the wave of unconstitutional change of power in West Africa itself. This is actually undermining the vitality of the civic space. So look at it in Mali, in Guinea, in Burkina Faso, there has actually been a change of government, unconstitutional change of government. But what is striking for me at this point here is that by civic group, many view this as a dishonorable benevolence that they can live with, or what they call an ad hoc survivor mechanism, which can be adopted to restore hope, instead of reading this action as a democratic recession that it stands for. So our colleagues that in the previous past we're fighting against tenure elogation, where the same sets of people now clapping, marching on the street to herald the welcome of these putschists in this country. I think this contradiction is a very big one, and it gives room for us to actually 
um, to reflect upon. In fact, interestingly, is that the, the civic group who rejected, who drove out Blaise Campore in 2014, and in 2015, rejected the Colonel Dindere coup d'etat and his RSP, were the same who we were on the streets in January 2022, welcoming Colonel Paul Damiba's coup d'etat itself. And that coup d'etat, for the first time, was actually toppling the first civilian or democratically elected leader of the country itself. Now, the second issue will be the rise of these non-state actors, which I have earlier mentioned. Um, the evolution and mutation, the continuity and discontinuity of the civic space is clearly impacted by the contingency of the moment, which is that insecurity that is blighting many parts of the region itself. In fact, if I take it back to the coup d'etat, one of the coarser challenges is the failure of democracy to deliver development to the people. But even if democracy cannot put food on the table of the people, people do want security. I think that is the least citizens do want. Each time we are on the field, they are saying, yes, if I don't have food, or can I have security? So I'm able to proceed with my life. These actors, of course, are not just making our work difficult, but they're also contributing and giving opportunity to the government to actually restrict the civic space. Across the continent, you find the, a wave of what they call anti-terrorism laws. It even affects our ability to receive money. It affects even our ability to conduct our duties. I tell you at the CDD in Nigeria, we have one staff whose main responsibility is to file with the Financial Action Tax Committee. Not in, in, no, no job except that, because the higher our transaction, the more we have to keep filing, or else they will climb down on us. We have to keep reporting and reporting almost on a daily basis once you do any transaction that is more than $10,000 like that. And in the face of this growing insecurity, you find that governments are not just using the terrorism law to even impede where we can go to or who we can receive money. Earlier today, I was, I was discussing how in Mali, it became very difficult to work in Mali because the ability to transfer money to partners at a point in time was taught. Then later, it became extremely difficult and it affects the transparency system or mechanisms we put in place, even if we have to go through other means to send this money. I'm talking now of even internal factors affecting us, not the one that is actually being weaponized by the government, um, weaponized by the government here. Groups are being shut down for supporting terrorist activity in conflict zone, and even you lack access to certain areas. So in like in our Boko Haram area in, uh, in Bornu State, before we can visit some sites, we have to go to the military and take permission. Without that permission, you cannot get on the UN flight to go to Goza, to go to many places. And that permission can actually be rejected. And there, you are going to service our citizens. Another way this, of course, has also been done is when they talk in terms of Yes, uh, fake news, hate speeches, and during process, uh, protest, we see increasingly that government is actually climbing down on the ability to give and to actually impart, to receive and impart information, really. Um, impart information, infringing on privacy, which are all fundamental rights enshrined in our national uh, constitution, even in our ECOWAS supplementary protocol on democracy and good governance and African Charter on elections, on democracy elections and good governance, and minus all regional and international framework that we have actually subscribed to. So if you take West Africa, for instance, out of the 15 ECOWAS countries, 12 of the countries have actually shut down the internet, with the exception of Guinea-Bissau, Ghana, and Cape Verde. And even increasingly, we are believing in some work we are doing at the CDD that because 
describing shutdown is not those numbers of days you can think of. A shutdown, we are finding, can be for 30 minutes, can be for two hours. So in some of these countries, there is even likelihood that has been shut down that we will think is just the, sub, uh, the what is it called, not uh, the provider being uh, epileptic or otherwise like that. Um, otherwise like that. And um, the classification of shutdown really for us should not just also be on internet shutdown, but what about the shutdown of our voices? Where, as academics, activists, we can no longer speak out without being sanctioned. At times, you are on newspaper, you write op-eds, newspapers are climbed down, you speak on TV, they find the TV, or even online, the eight and vituals that are targeted at us are quite a legion. Beyond the amplification or of hashtag to shut down what is trending. So today we can have all our hashtags, or they can choose to promote another hashtag, which we silence and become more amplified, shutting what we are doing at this particular moment down. And I think these are important ways we have to start thinking of what and how to do this. And there are lots of efforts to also curtail free speech. So if you look at it, five countries since 2015 have come up with Cyber Crimes Act. Some have even almost replicated maybe the Nigerian or the Indian, Chinese one, like that. Prescribing jail term fines when we do not even have a real definition of what constitutes disinformation or eight speeches, and it can be weaponized. While five others have actually modified their laws to deal with this uh, menace. And I think we should think deeply about this. Has government start thinking and defining in, um, peaceful protest or just organic protest as insurrection? And I'm sure in August, we all saw that happen in Sierra Leone, where the protest of the people were deemed by the government to be a form of insurrection, minus the 2020 NSAS protests in Nigeria, where our government president said it was an attempt to actually remove him from office, not a protest by young people on police um, brutality. And at the same time, you find many countries are moving towards the Chinese model of digital authoritarianism. In fact, a shima of most of our countries have either visited China for training, or they have procured equipment from China, minus plus other illiberal actors to surveil us, to shut our voice, and in fact, to listen to our conversation. So those days we have conversation on WhatsApp and we deem it to be safe are long gone because there are so much investment on being able to read and to listen to our WhatsApp call and read our chats at the same time, as well as studying the internet firewall uh, work so that they can block social media or effect um, arrest. I think another important point is that the porosity between the civil society, political parties, private fair, public fair and media in West Africa constitutes a challenge itself to the civic space. And people and the political class are now capitalizing on this because they have seen it happen historically. So when you look at 1991, you find that people banded together, uh, the young people, unemployed, excluded from political power in Mali, banded together to house uh, Musa Traore from office. They later came and established their own political party to get into power. Even with the Blaise Campore CDP, in his 27 years, he co-opted a lot of civil society as part and parcel of this movement um, itself. So both opposition and ruling party are establishing a lot of dubious alliances with CSOs to benefit from their mobilization capacity, especially around elections. And at times, 
to do their dubious um, bidding. And here I gave the example of Nigeria, Hamali, uh, as very, uh, and Burkina Faso as important uh, example. That even within that short period of Cornel Damiba, in um, led M MSP, how led military transition, he had his own civil society. And since President Buhari became president in Nigeria in 2015, 300 additional government-sponsored civil society emerged. In fact, some of them will come to our office. They will not just write and call us names. They visited many offices to create blockade and accuse them of working against the government of Nigeria while threatening people even with bodily um, arm. So this recent slide, of course, the civics, this shrinking of the civic space is becoming more and more real. And you will even find it in press freedom, uh, press freedom itself. So if you look at the last seven years since 2017, from becoming a good student of press, press freedom, we have come to a place where media are, is becoming more and more restricted. And each passing year, 2021, we scored below our grade, and 2022, we scored even lower. So with each passing year, there is increasing decline, even in our civic, um, in our civic um, spaces across the West Africa uh, sub-region. But I think when it comes to the external actors, there are two important key uh, factors I would want us to really take away here. One is the rising role of liberal actors on the continent. And two is our work in the new face of this information disorder. The rise of the liberalism should be a source of concern for democracy promoters. And I think that for us in West Africa, it should be big because at every point we pride ourselves by saying that the third wave of democracy started from this, from West Africa with the Benin Constitutional Conference of 1991. But in the last two years, we have seen six successful coups and two unsuccessful coups. If you look at Niger in December 2020 and Guinea-Bissau, February 2022 as well. And we have seen coup, and we have seen what they call the correction coup in Mali, aside from the coup, of course, the double coup uh, in Burkina Faso. And I had a chat because they are parts and parcel of us. Across these countries that have actually experienced coups in this last uh, two years, there are converging trends. One is a history of contested elections. When you look at it from Mali, uh, Mali, even the Chadian, um, maybe Burkina, that is insecurity, Guinea, of course, tenure elongation uh, as well. And insecurity, which is fast, not just located in the Sahel, but is fast spreading into coastal West Africa, such that Togo, Benin, and even our hosts here, Ghana, should start worrying like that. But within this framework, you have young people, a very young demography of more than 60%. This demography are people who have never experienced military regime, or they have very faint idea of what it means to live under the military regime. They have the social media in their hand as very active, and they want democracy and good governance. To, uh, they want democracy that will deliver development to them. It's all these challenges that the liberal actors are actually exploiting. They are not operating in a vacuum beyond the politics of geopolitics itself, where people are trying to make new friends. But they are also exploiting what is happening on our continent. And currently, in fact, if you look at West Africa, you just have too many of them, not just the Russia and China we are often fixated on. You have Iran, you have Turkey, you have even ones we don't even know are actually operating in our system or trying to grab a part 
of our patrimonial uh, hegemony itself. And we are seeing it in real actions. For instance, in Burkina, we saw how and Mali, how our own people came and work and started demanding that the Wagner group be brought in as the savior to fight, to liberate them. After they themselves had invited France to come in in 2012 with over the Manila um, crisis itself. But we also saw how they co-opted people like myself as Russia to speak for them as experts, not just forming disinformation as we like to put it. They are also right on ground, co-opting people who can speak, experts and buying them to, uh, to their side. And this liberalism is helping to engender this shrinking civic space. It's not just providing harms or providing social media, it's providing an alternative to them that we should start asking ourselves, will we still be relevant as democracy practitioner? What elections will we be monitoring when immediately after the coup d'etat in, in uh, Guinea, the first person, the Colonel Dumbuya met, was the ambassador to, the, to Russia. And after they agreed that there would be no, the mind will continue working. It was already a fair conflict. The same in Mali, as people were trooping in to speak to the uh, Asimu Goita's regime, they were posting it on social media. And after that, it was more like, what can we do? They've already been accepted by the people. That was what the impression they gave. And this is an interesting trend we have to watch out to. Professor Prempe made mention of Freedom House in debt. But what we should note is that out of 12 countries that suffered the most democratic decline in, in the world in 2021, I think five of them were actually from West Africa. And this trajectory is also reiterated in the newly released 2022 Freedom House Index itself. The second issue is the internet itself. The internet is a force of good for us because we have used it to change policy, we've used it to mobilize, we use it in our daily activities. But increasingly, the dangers of the internet is also beginning to challenge everything that we do, particularly as we speak about information disorder. Or either our work when it comes to gender equality promotion, it is challenged because the same actors are using it to re-emphasize the role that are in the offline space, online. It's being used to confuse voters, it's being used to sow apathy to the people, it's being used to actually sell liberalism where people are querying the quotient of democracy itself and saying that what can this democracy deliver when you can get better roads faster and uh, without the separation of powers and checks and balances as impediment itself. And I think that as civic actors ourselves, we are not even left out in the attacks as we are bullied online. And some do have offline implications. We have seen people that after they abuse them online, they go to their house and they even attack um, them. So this information disorder is not just attacking democracy, the bedrock of all the work we do, either in peace and security, either in accountability, election promotion, gender equality, every single facet of our work, but also the successes we have actually recorded in the last decade. But how well are we equipped to address these issues as civic actors beyond framing it as is fake news, we have to start answering this question. Now, not to bore people, I'll just quickly go to the civil society part and round up since I'll make the paper available. I also think that we do have internal challenges that we will have to confront and has come with us as the civic space continue to evolve in this last couple of years. 
The professionalization of the civil society is one of it, really. Why it represents a system of solidarity and system of interest leading to the first case, the categories of believers that we have in all the Jima Boadis, Professor Karikari and Co. It has also created careerists whose only interest is just to work and to jump from one organization to the other. These do also have serious effect in our ability to transform the civic space ourselves. And in that light also, we have seen people who have come, not just as government-organized civil society, but also briefcase civil society, which are actually led by individuals and which actually serve their own interest itself. The fact that we have not built on membership the way it used to be, means that civil society groups are no longer owned by people. And we ourselves are gradually facing the legitimacy challenge ourselves. If we are asked, whose interest do we serve? How many civic actors would be able to hope, raise up their hand and answer that? Because increasingly, there is actually a disconnect between us. Professor Primpe, you can answer that. But not everybody can do have that itself. And this lack of rural outlook is actually important when it comes to democracy promotion and opening up the civic space if we really want to be truthful to ourselves. Because nobody is able to protect the civic space more than the citizens who are actually affected by it. We want the civic space to expand, then we will have to improve on the quality of the citizenry themselves uh, as the panacea to this. Um, uh, to this issue, and we have to work for our legitimacy in the eyes of the people. And I used to say this joke that in Nigeria, the politicians say all the time that it seems it's more lucrative to be a member of the civil society than to be a politician, because every day you'll be traveling all over the world, you'll be taking selfies, and you'll be driving in four-wheel drive. So why be a politician if you can be a civic um, actor? Um, how that looks itself. And we are also seeing civil society who are legitimizing illiberal actors. The Yeolo in Mali is an example of this. The same thing, we are also seeing media groups who are being created or who are collecting money just to publish press statements without knowing what is the origin of this op-ed or this press statement itself. I also think that our strategies is due for us to review as civic actors uh, currently. We push for policy change, we do advocacy, we do convening, we cooperate. But below the pyramid again, we have to see how this drills down to the people. And I think for us at the CDD, what we have basically done is that we have disentangled it, such that people like Idaya talks to policymakers, but some of my colleagues are the grassroots people that we are increasingly, we have now become a think and do tank not just a think tank that is talking and talking and talking itself. And I think when it comes to the strategies, the donor agenda setting is also important because when you look at Guinea, for instance, why the FNNDC was busy fighting to ensure there was no tenure elimination, not one donor gave them money. Only one that gave them money is now extinct. But now people are ready to support a transitional arrangement, which could actually have been prevented in the first instance. Then transmitting one strategy from one place to the other does not effectively work. With all this talk about technology becoming important, or youth-led movement has ways of addressing issues. Yet, the youth are very important, but they have to be mentored and have opportunities to collaborate with experienced individual and group which we are seeing today with the caliber of senior actors that are present uh, at this CDD um, Ghana event. Then polarization within the movement itself, we are increasingly becoming more and more polarized and we have to work on that, as well as our internal working of civil society. How do we make ourselves to be more organized? How do we keep our book open? How do we fight for our legitimacy? And how do we start building upon the next generation of civic actors are quite important. 
when I look at this room today, I ask myself that um, how do we retain the expertise that are there? They are LinkedIn in Senegal, the Jean Mabwadi, the Jibrin Ibrahim, the Emmanuel Akwete, the Alim South of this world. They are growing older. We are trying, but can we fit that space? And how well are we also building people with those set of ethics, convictions, beyond expertise, who can walk the talk in the next decade? In the next decade, uh, as very, very important itself. Um, then I think the last point I want to talk about is we also need to think about remuneration as very important for civic actors and themselves. One thing I found quite interesting and enlightening with all the coup data was the way the civic actors kept jostling to be part of the transitional arrangement, possibly if they had pension. If they had a very good remuneration, it would not have become as enticing as it really is itself. So in conclusion, I said that the civil society movement have evolved in the last decade with expansion into the professional model, grievance-driven movement are some of the new faces, but there are challenges, both internal and external factors that inhibit the civil society movement in the region. Some of these challenges will have to be addressed by the movement itself. The professionalization, the strategies, the better condition of services for staff, prioritizing pension and health insurance, addressing the polarization existing between us, and importantly, solidarity, which is what Wadamos is currently doing now. The absence of solidarity is inhibiting the work that we do. When I joined CDD, I was covering our West African work, and my work was always to bring people together in all those countries. Now as the director, to organize people for solidarity, I get tired. I have to pick up the phone, start calling people, begging them. There seems to be a lactage. We have to awaken that, because together we stand, uh, united we stand, individual we can actually do little or nothing. And we also have to ramp up funding, but we must recognize at this stage that it is not the solution to our problem. And we must build this intergenerational gap between us, which we are already seeing and which I am a beneficiary of. We have to do more of that while building legitimacy. But we have to confront two and very important things, which again, I go back to the digital as important itself that as authoritarianism resurges in West Africa with coup and ratification coup taking place, increasingly flawed elections, restricting civic space, the trust deficit is also increasing. So as a group, we must push and transform to being truly popular and legitimate institution. At the same time, the ECOWAS do also have an increasing role to play in this. In terms of legal framework for protecting and nurturing the emergence of a true civic space itself. Maybe then we can truly harness the potential of what they call the echoes of the people that we say we are actually moving towards. And finally, we have to situate our voices in this old politics of geopolitics that we have been talking about. What is at stake? A lot is at stake when we talk in terms of geopolitics. But as civic actors ourselves, we have not made our voices heard. We have not made our alignment. We are allowing the conversation to be had over us. We are even allowing some of this conversation to be between nations and nations, while we are just there as non-part, not non, I, I, maybe I, I, I'm trying to look for a diplomatic word to use, as onlookers, mere onlookers, where the battle for geopolitics is happening on our continent itself. And for the information disorder, the ball is on our court because this is very, very important we must highlight. It's not that it is new to society itself. It has always been part and parcel of society in ancient time. The difference is the techniques, the multiplicity of techniques that is being used. The proliferation of actors, the rich, of this. 
and the danger that it portends to democracy. So how are we going to watch? How are we going to act from this and stop talking about certain facts from fiction being difficult or making it really about fake news? Because even when it comes to elections, people's mind can actually be rigged before they get to the polling unit. The use of data-driven polit uh, politics makes people to make a lot of decisions without knowing itself. And the intrusion on our privacy is even making it very difficult for some of us to have genuine conversations with ourselves. So these has proven to be very important areas we really need to look at, looking inward and looking externally to get that civic space that we all desire and this long sustainable democracy, which we go back to the founding words, mission and objective of the two CDDs, which is making democracy to deliver development to the people. Thank you very much. Please keep it going, keep it going for her. Thank you very much. Please take your seats, Madam Hidayat Hassan, the Director of the Center for Democratic Development um, in Abuja, Nigeria, for that wonderful, wonderful lecture. It's the 17th Kunti Ni Akwamu lecture. And I would want to, at this point, I know that many of you were nodding in agreement, those who were also disagreeing at some point. She's made herself available. We will take questions, comments briefly uh, before we wrap up this evening's event. You can continue the discussion if you're joining us on social media or you're on Joy News or Joy 99.7 FM. The hashtag is Kronti2022 and also hashtag open civic spaces. The microphones are available, but I would want to quickly uh, do some acknowledgements. Uh, if I haven't seen you, I have seen you. Um, please, thank you very much for being a part of this evening's program. But I want to acknowledge the presence of the National Security Minister, Honorable Kandapa. Please, let's hear it for him. He's seated right at the back there. Thank you so much uh, for being a part of this evening's discussion. We also have Dr. Kwesi Jonah with IDEC also with us. Thank you. We have Mary Ada with a GII with us. Thank you. We have Mr. Suleiman Abraima of the Media Foundation for West Africa also in our midst. Where is Suleiman? Okay, great to see you. We have Dr. Ali Dusedu, head of department, political science, Lagon. He's hiding right behind Mr. Emmanuel Akwete. <laughs> we have Madam Kathy Adi, Commissioner, NCCE, also in our midst. Please, where is Madam Kathy? Okay, she's out there. We also have Miss Esther Equia Jemfi Esquire, Executive Secretary, Disability Council, also in our midst. Please, thank you. We have, we have Reverend Dr. Cyril Fayose with the Christian Council, General Secretary, Christian Council. Okay, right there. Thank you so much. We have Professor Yebua Boating with the NCA, also in our midst. Reverend John. Apia Kuran, Pentecostal Charismatic Council, also in our midst, and you as well for being a part of this evening's program. At this point, um, if you want to ask any questions, you want to make any comments, additions, if I could see by hand quickly, the microphones are available, then we can take your comment. Do we have a comment from Mr. Etia? Do you want to make any comment? The Deputy, um, Minister, the Attorney General, Deputy Attorney General in the Ministry of Justice. We want to make a comment? Okay, we'll start with him. Thank you very much. As I listen to you with rapt attention, and let me commend you for the delivery. I've been monitoring the activities of some of the CSOs. And as you rightly indicated, when it comes to funding, it appears those who fund try to detect how they also do the activities. I would suggest that instead of CSOs, but to rely on donors. I would say it's not a bad idea, but you must be very careful as to which donors you take money from. Because if you take money from donors who are not into good activities, they will eventually affect the way you also do your activities. So I know Ghana CDD is a very formidable one. 
I know how they also try to make sure that they receive funding from the right sources. But my caution is that we must make sure we get the funding from the right sources, but not diluted sources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's the Deputy Attorney General. Any other comments or questions? I have my own question that um, I penned down. The issue about remuneration and the pensions uh, for civic actors, exactly where it should come from. It's my question uh, that we can pen down and then we can get answers for that. I see Mr. Manola Kuti itching. Is there a comment that we can take from you, Mr. Kuti? <laughs> yes. Yeah, but, but I, I'm wondering if indeed the civil society is to take something from outside, from digital sources. I think we're generalizing something. Um, registered civil society organizations are organizations with boards, with their networks registered, they are well known. If you go to the bank today at the civil society, a new civil society, an old one, um, to put any project money, they want to see the document, where it came from. They have access to your sponsors. So they are, I think civil society groups probably may be doing more legitimate job than two organizations. You see, political parties, uh, we don't know where they get their money because they are funding, their members don't pay the dues. I'm talking about Ghana. That will give them a lot of you know, support that they need, plus registered supporters. So the framework of civil society organizations are accounting for sources of funding. It's more stringent and very structured, which is not what you get from, with political parties, who at some point will be part of civil society, and another point they say they are part of political society. Okay. Um, I think the most important thing for me is that probably the civic space um, has come under a lot of stress from the digital age and the collapse of the kind of regulatory framework which we operated in, in the past. And it's a new world. It's a world that so many things are, you know, not controlled by our physical structures if we do not have the technology. Um, by and large, in West Africa, we also know that um, there has been concerns about terrorism financing, how jihadists are getting in and so on. Um, no research has so far proven that the registered civil society groups with their boards and so on, who are under a lot of scrutiny. And then the banks actually also report you know, on terrorism financing, even if you're going to put money in the banks now, they have to know the source. But there are many who do not go to the banks. Just like people who do drugs and people who get money from other sources who do not put the money in the bank. So we need to find out a much broader view than target civil society. We are pretty much under control, okay. you know, from our, our, our funders and sources. Thank Dr. you. Akwiti, thank you. Do we have any other contribution? Dr. Kujo Kumpuni, yes, sir. Okay. All right, thank you. And um, thank you, my sister, Ideat. That was a very packed um, presentation. I'm looking forward to reading the, the paper itself because there's so many uh, issues that you've raised uh, in your lecture. I wanted to, maybe just a top up, uh, just trying to understand if there are tension between our quest for digital rights and securing through in, in the digital space with all the challenges that you've thrown up from the digital space, this tension that you know, we are grappling with. Have you seen anywhere on the continent where you see some promise that they've got it right? in terms of that balance. And if there are no real examples, what, what about outside, outside of the African continent? Where do you see that maybe that balance is it's emerging? Uh, if you can share that with us. Okay. Thank you. And since the microphone is very close to the National Security Minister, 
I don't know if you would want to put in a word or two before his busy schedule takes him away. Thank you. No comment. Honorable Kanapa, I would love to hear your voice. Say no into the microphone. <laughs> okay, it's actually a no. Okay, he's taking it. Thank you. A very good lecture. I'm delighted uh, I came. I believe the CSOs have played a very, very important role to play in any democratic uh, uh, exercise. And I think governments must be held accountable. We need a group of people who will always hold government accountable. Indeed, our constitution is there, realizes the need for accountability and did set up a number of institutions. Our laws have also set up a number of accountability institutions to hold government ac accountable. But what you realize in practice is that most of these institutions that have been set up either by the constitution or by acts of parliament really do not have the independence that is needed for them to be able to hold government uh, accountable, to be able to hold government accountable in the interest of the society. What you really need, it's not money, it's, it's independence. You really need to be independent of the uh, governmental institution that you are trying to oversight and also to hold uh, accountable. Most of these horizontal accountability institutions, you agree, are not really independent, and it's always been said that our hope when it comes to accountability lies in the civil society organizations. Most times, they are very, very uh, independent. In Ghana, we've been very lucky. We started with some civil society organizations that you would always link to a particular political party. Okay. These days, they, they are not like that. I don't know the political color of CDD. I suspect them though. Uh, I don't know the political color of uh, the Institute of Economic Affairs. Dr. Koete here, nobody knows uh, where he belongs to. And I think that is good for Ghana. And there are so many uh, institutions that are doing very well. I can only uh, congratulate them and uh, urge them uh, on. I like the topic of the evolution of civic space in modern African democracy. You see, democracy that has no space for civic actors, you do. And it's important that we have the civil actors or even the non-state actors to hold government uh, to account. Okay. My advice though, you know after 16 years in politics, I said to myself, well that is enough, let me see what I can do to help my country in civil society. I joined civil society for about four years before going back into politics. So, I think I know a little bit about civil society. And my advice is that we should not leave government to the political actors, not only to the politicians. Civil society must see themselves as being part of the governance system. Okay. The trouble is that most civil society organizations have no respect for government. They think we are corrupt, they think we have no brains, they think uh, we are just useless. I don't think it's good enough, because that obviously is not true. We can help our country better if the two of us work together. You have a very, very important role to hold government accountable. Do that. But when you do that, thinking that there can be nothing good that comes out from the government, I don't think in Ghana we do that, but I think we do that in other countries. I don't think it's good for democracy. I congratulate okay. the lecturer. She was very, very good. And I also want to say how delighted I am any time I see civil society doing what it does uh, in the country. Thank we you. appreciate your comments. Thank you. That's Honorable Kandaka. So taking some comments, um, let's go back to Madame Midayat Hassan. Thank you very much. I agree with the Honorable Minister. 
I think that our work will have to be defined by mutual respect, really. And when we work with government, we go a long way. When you look at CDD here, they say bridging research and practice to promote good governance. Their research should actually be made available to inform policy direction of the government. But we also have to understand that it's not all civil society that is government facing. Some have to hold them to account. Some have to give technical expertise. Some have to mobilize the people. So our work is clear and cut out for us, but it must be defined by mutual respect and a little bit less of adversaria uh, in the future, really. On the question of digital rights, really, I, I may be bold to say that still in this world today, Africa is still one of the continents. When we talk in terms of the digital, we can say that it is still promoting good. It's still a force of social good compared to the developed world where they don't even see it as a force for good. Again, it's always more about the information pollution or the information disorder that has become increasingly the challenge. And I think it's really a challenge for us as well. If we start looking at it on how it affects democracy in the real sense, maybe by the time we place it as a parameter to all our aims, vision, objective, and we start looking at it one after the other, on how it is affecting it, we might start thinking deeply on how to evolve better practices. And I also think the challenge is that most of the countries are focused more on this as, oh, we are just going to sanction, we are going to deal with them, we are going to create laws and throw everybody in prison, and we are going to lock up the journalists, lock up the civil society, fish out the boy that is actually... Um, making all these uh, fake news when it comes to information disorder. But that doesn't work in the first instance, because if you look at the ready market for the producers, it's as a result of unemployment. That is why people take the job to take, uh, like, how many CDs. In fact, from Ghana, they transposed the propaganda secretary to Kano, a state in northern Nigeria. They came to learn from Ghana and they started calling themselves propaganda secretary. And they are paid less than $50 because it's a job for them. It's an employment opportunity if you take it from just that one dimension alone. Then the rules itself, how does it work? How many people are you going to throw in jail? And when we talk in terms of fact checking, we have moved beyond fact checking to now pre-bunking again as a way, then even using more tech, because we are playing catch up. Information technology is growing on a daily basis. The developed worlds are like this. We are still just coming like this, trying to be manual. But the EU continues to be a model. But these are important conversation we should have asked the national level and also collectively at the regional level itself. I know for the, uh, the supplementary protocol amendment, we made proposals to actually enrich this itself as one of the ways we could deal with it beyond the unconstitutional change uh, of governance, uh, which has been a focus uh, itself. And uh, the stress from the digital space is actually affecting the civic group more than we claim to agree. Even the funding that you are talking about, people can go today, start GoFundMe, and say they are doing a mission. And at the end, they wouldn't even achieve anything. They would have raked in some 5000 or $10,000, and people will look at all of us the same way. It is also being used to delegitimize our work. Now the forthcoming. In fact, when we did the uh, verification for Twitter, for CDD Ghana, I did both CDD Ghana and CDD West Africa together because it was the election period. And it was very important for us because considering the elections, our handle could be cloned and they would go and make announcement and say that somebody has won. CDD Ghana has proclaimed John Mahama as the winner of the presidential elections. Who would debunk that? Before you even know, it would have gone viral. And when you look at this 
uh, what is the new owner, Elon Musk, and even talking about paying for verification. In less than two days, he wreaked a lot of havoc on the whole world because people were taking up the eight dollars, getting verified, and creating pseudo handles to actually pass information. Some people have gone to court to deal with that. But think of the chaos that it actually causes beyond the cross platforming that a story will just sit, it will start on uh, WhatsApp before you know it's on Twitter, it's on um, Instagram, it's on TikTok, which is unregulated, and even in our countries, we don't have regulation for, for it. So as much as it's delegitimizing government, it's also delegitimizing us and the work that we actually do. It's being used to bully, bully us. It is bringing less legitimacy when people even come and start raising all this money, the issue of funding that has also come up today. But I also want to say when it comes to funding, civil society are very careful in the fund that they receive. One, because the reporting template on us is already very strenuous. Like I said, we have to have one staff. Why should we hire one extra person? Because we do not want to get into trouble with the government. We have to scrutinize. We have to make sure we are reporting. The bank will come for every single dollar that comes into the account. You must be able to account for it. You will send the contract. In fact, God forbid your contract has expired and you did not finish implementing your project, you will have to bring an addendum and you must explain to the bank and the government why you did not finish spending this money during this period. But we do also know that as a survival mechanism, governments are establishing their own civil society. Illiberal actors are funding civic movement as well. They are funding civic movement. We've seen it in Mali. We've seen it in Burkina, where even the space of the church, of the mosque, is beginning a rallying point to talk about Russian incursion into that space. And we have seen the media. So there is actually a lot. And all this money, again, I, I work, especially talking on foreign disinformation, political finance, and opaque debt, they are all interlinked. Because when we are talking here, People are not passing money directly to people. If they are funding your political campaign, for instance, they are paying the people directly. They are paying through cryptocurrency. In fact, we have a blog in Nigeria. I will not call the name before she starts, uh, he or she starts <laughs> trolling me right now. It's more of a bully platform on Instagram. But that platform does not receive money true bank transfer solely cryptocurrency and has got a lawyer in panama so when you report a platform a lawyer is already there in panama ensuring that she gets accountability for all the cyber bullying that is being done for delegitimizing people even for picking on ordinary people for being celebrity all in the guise of fighting for accountability. So there are numerous challenges, but I think that these challenges are for us to examine and to address. And I think one critical point the National Security Minister made is that we have to strive for accountability because the civic space is the barometer of the average people. Some people take up accountability just because they are, on radio, they are listening to their radio or watching their TV and seeing, a, they, they will even say and say, ah, Emmanuel Akwete has said it. Jima Bwadi said this. Professor Prempe has said this. Ah, Kojo Asante, we are going to go and protest. It gives them hope. That hope, that hope, that energy to fire on. And we have been told that there is a difference between hope and optimism. Even from a scholarly point of view, that optimism is good. But the minute democracy lacks hope, there is that loss of hope in democracy. That is the end of democracy itself. Okay. So we have to keep on keeping up the hope 
in the hearts of citizens. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'll try to draw a triangle just there. Um, three men caught my attention, but unfortunately, a lady's hand is up. So I'll pick the lady. If it's a question, just 30 seconds. If it's a comment, one minute, then we can wrap this up. After that, the gentleman behind, the gentleman in suit, and then Mr. Suleiman Abraima. That's the last batch I can take for now. So, Madam, please, can you give Madam the microphone? Please, can you check the microphone for her? Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Yunam Kudunu, representing Dr. Patrick Ewa, Ashesi University. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, interesting lecture. And the list, tall list of challenges that we are facing. And these challenges are coming from human beings, even if it's technology, human beings, and we are also human beings. My simple question is this, solutions. Have, you know, convincing solutions. What can we do? What preventive measures must we put in place? Because, okay. Thank you. Please pass the microphone on to the gentleman right behind you. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Nana Kujo Usu. I think uh, Madam Idiot has uh, touched on some points in her response vis-a-vis -vis social media. I think that we will find it very dangerous if we don't tackle uh, the effects of social media. Number one, you mentioned a person whose name begins with M, who can right now, because he's taking the company private, can decide whatever he wants to do and there's nothing that we can do to stop him. But it has effects on us here in West Africa. We need to find a way to educate people so that they can understand the fact that there are algorithms which on these social media platforms are pushing us to be polarized and anti one another because that's the way that they can sell adverts and so on and so forth. Okay. And secondly, we have to find a way of starting to educate people. Um, Was um, NCCE um, how to uh, see what is fake news and how to uh, uh, inoculate ourselves against that. So those are areas that I think are very important, especially if you're looking in Ghana towards 2024, there's going to be an explosion of fake news. Okay. And uh, we'd have to find a way to fight that. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. The microphone, I'm sorry, gentleman in blue, I didn't see you early. So yes, gentleman in suit, and then Mr. Suleiman Abraima, then we can wrap this up. I'm sorry, I'll give you another opportunity. <laughs> my name is Sika Antobre. Um, so my, my question will be a continuation of what the honorable gentleman just said. I just want to find out, probably from the speaker, and if the minister will be kind to respond, the level of threat that social media polarization is posing to the civic space, especially considering the fact that through artificial intelligence, I'll be able to determine what your, your, your behavior is like. This is very serious, especially looking at the fact that now we have a very prominent member amongst us on the Twitter space and every day is telling us where Twitter is likely to go. Okay. What is the level of threat? I, I just don't want us to speak in vacuum. Okay. And if the minister will be kind to help okay. us. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Suleiman Abraham, I will take the last one from you. Thank you very much. Um, well, that was a, a, a very powerful delivery. Thank you very much, uh, my sister Idayat. Good to see you again. Um, people have talked about uh, a lot about the technology side of the issues, I, so I wouldn't go there even though I also had some concerns. Um, I would want to pick your thoughts on ECOWAS and its role in our region. Um, and I'm premising it on the fact that ECOWAS Vision 2020 it was ECOWAS of the people and not ECOWAS of states. Now there is ECOWAS Vision 2050 and they are talking about ECOWAS of the people, peace and security and prosperity for all. 
We've seen as the situation in Guinea, for example, where people decided to assert their rights to ensure that they defend democracy. To a large extent, I would say ECOWAS looked on until Afakonde was forcefully removed and we all saw him sitting in the chair with his T-shirt and all of that. And then swiftly ECOWAS intervenes to demand the release of Afakonde, the safety and protection of Afakonde. Meanwhile, over 100 people had been killed in the process leading to the coup d'etat and it was as if those lives didn't matter. Similar things were happening in Cote d'Ivoire, where term and location processes were ongoing. People were being brutalized, people were being tortured, people were being killed. Again, we didn't see any significant intervention, but I am sure if there was any move to oust the then government on the basis of the killing of the people, the abuses of the people and all of that, ECOWAS would have acted to say, we want you to protect Afa Conde. I think we've seen similar things in some of these places. So I just want your thoughts. Do you think ECOWAS is really acting in a way to defend our democracy? Um, and also in the context of the early warning program, do you think that indeed that early warning program of ECOWAS is really working? Because okay. I'm sure we would have picked the early warnings about some of these Okay. Things that could bring because the gentleman in blue Thank touched you. the microphone, you might as well just give him 30 seconds to actually ask the question. Then that will be it for the questions. All right. Thank you, Emifa. My name is Divine Kwe. I work with Africa Education Watch. Uh, uh, and I thanks for the presentation. We are looking, I agree with you, that we need to do a lot to increase the civic space. Uh, notwithstanding, I also want us to ask ourselves, if the space is increased, what are we doing ourselves to fill up the space? Because that's very important. Even with the little space we have, it's only filled by, though we have a lot of civil society organization, it's being filled by just a little of them. So while the need for us to increase the space, CSOs and the civic movement as well, we need to increase their own capacity to be able to come out to the space. That when the gap is given to us, government or so we, uh, we are targeting for our advocacy towards, we know that yes, we have the capacity to fill the space. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the insightful questions and comments there. We'll take the final remark from Madame oh. Dayat. Thank you very much. Suleimana wants to put me into trouble. <laughs> it was part of the people working on the 2050 agenda. So you shouldn't be asking me some of these questions. But you have raised very critical points, really that we shouldn't shy away from. You forgot to add Mali, how all the head of state converged in Mali uh, before the house of uh, Ibika uh, in Mali without listening to what the grievances of the people were. And I remember writing that this even um, saying they wanted to protect a regime without even being inclusive of young people and women in their presentation and how they looked at that point. And I think what we've been lacking at the level of ECOWAS in this last couple of years has been leadership, really. So what is the quality of leadership at that point? We are talking of restrictive civic space here. Who are the people restricting our civic space? They are still the same people who are our leaders at the level of ECOWAS, and it has become a continuum. In fact, if you look at the big Guinea-Bissau uh, challenge. You will see that when the prime minister or the president, they were, they were, they still had case in court. They had not concluded it. But what did he do? He started paying visits from Senegal to Niger to Nigeria. He was duly recognized by this president, and de facto, he became the president, in spite of ECOWAS' insistence on completing the process. So there is a difference between, of course, the commission itself, the bureaucrats, and, of course, the political leadership of ECOWAS. And, of course, this also surpassed capacity, funding challenge, the, uh, the in lack of interest of the big nations who previously have held ECOWAS together in the past. So the ECOWAS of today, the synergy we enjoy, the support 
uh, for us is missing. Maybe the last positive I'll see will be the Gambian case of how collectively we banded together and were able to get um, uh, what is Yaya Jami out as the last and the most significant decision made at the level of ECOWAS itself. And ECOWAS will have to do a lot in terms of redeeming our legitimacy. And when it comes to early warning, there is a difference between preventive diplomacy itself, how preventive are this diplomacy. We see the threats, we see the fragility. While I was talking, I was talking about the Sahel, but already mentioning that this insecurity is already on its way into coastal West Africa. What are we doing in terms of addressing it? So more and more, and I think the space has become us. And that is the disenchantment of citizens with democracy itself. And that is why the solution to what Madame has asked, first and foremost, is an engaged citizenry. The quality of citizenship will determine the quality of democracy. The minute we stop being sit down look and being like, okay, another four years is going to pass, we are going to vote them out. Or after five years, we vote them out. We have another person in. We are following them from day one and demanding accountability from that same social media and from our constituents, from that uh, the regional government, the local government level, the municipals. I think things will become better. And organizing, not just as former civil society here, I found that the most effective organizing are even those social groups we have, those familiar groups in those villages, their voice, their power, their influence is something that is very important. So we have to look at fear of influence as in, an important strategy in the work that we do. Now, when it comes to social media, I think the social media is actually much more dangerous than we are thinking about. And the attention we receive is very little. So while I, I always say that the attention Brazil and India receive is better than what we, as Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, receives. While we are now receiving this, the like of Cape Verde, Bissau, Mali, they are just non-existent on the radar of the social media group. So we are even lucky to be prioritized. But the content moderation rules that applies in the north does not apply in the global south. The rules are existing but nobody is actually implementing them the same way. Then when we talk about global standards also, how inclusive is, are the development of these global standards? So somebody is making global standards. Earlier this year, they brought me to write all the bits and pieces, but even I was not invited to the conversation uh, when the pieces, but was writing it. Then how many people, when I watch the video of the conversation, just like 12 people, to speak for West Africa, who necessarily do not even understand the nuances. So we have to talk about global standards, but rooted in lo local nuances, the way it affects us. Because even with the algorithm, it's being gamed. So if you want to just say, use the F word, it's just to write F, then you write, you omit the U, you put the C and the K, and the algorithm will not pick it up, let alone our local languages. Then while government is focusing so much on regulating the social media, the focus should be on creating standards that the tech platforms you are there to in our own countries. That is what is missing. So what is the framework for a Twitter, a Facebook, uh, what is it called, TikTok, Google to operate in Ghana? Or what is it to operate in Nigeria where we took an adversarial measure which now incited the government against the people? Are we even having the police with them? So in our forthcoming elections, we are doing a compact for the first time that instead of you coming to take pictures, we are coming to actually sign an agreement with you. But we are not asking you to come with your public affairs people like Idayat that can speak grammar. Come with the engineers that knows what the basic minimum are. Because it's actually the danger is much more than you can think of. With the data, which is what we, have, we really talk about, 
In 2019, they had a very global report which Tactica Tech produced and called it the influence industry. So the influence industry looks at every practice that is used in the North, in the US, in the UK. They ask us to contextualize that to the Nigerian context. And I'll tell you that when I finished the paper, I was so surprised that almost all the strategies they were using in the United States is actually being used to skew the election in Nigeria. And we as election observers, we do not even know that. It's the same way people weaponize this social media to cause conflict. In Côte d'Ivoire, it was used to suppress voters. In Côte d'Ivoire, when they, when one person even tweeted fake news, one person died in the market. In just in play, two states in Nigeria, many people died just because of the picture from DRC Congo that was instrumentalized. Even non-state actors, harmed groups like Boko Haram, JN High M, they use it to mobilize like that. But when you check the rules, you see on Telegram, on weekly basis, they can delete two groups that is spreading those kind of information, those kind of influence, conducting influence operation as it relates to Syria or the United States. But when it comes to Nigeria or Mali or Niger, rarely are groups deleted on Telegram, which is a very big mobilizing platform that can take more than 5,000 people. And where, as researchers, we latch on and we are even able to understand what they are actually planning, let alone downgrading the algorithm of some of these insidious videos that are on YouTube. So the accountability framework is really and extensively missing, but it is our work to do. I think those are the new areas Mm -hmm. of work we really have to define for ourselves. Okay. What will be our stake in this new politics of geopolitics as civic actors? We have to have a voice in it. As it relates to the digital, what is our objective and agenda that we will be pushing with our government and the platform itself in terms of accountability? Uh, because I think uh, uh, as we move into the future, with each challenges that comes, like I've said earlier, our work evolves and it changes. We are responding from independence to military era to uh, now saying we are democracy sustaining to some people pushing against grievances such as tenure elongation and political reform to now that we are seeing again the return of coup d'etat, the rise of illiberal actors, the role the digital is actually playing in terms of polarizing us ethnically, uh, gender-wise, religious, in all ramification itself. And thank you very much uh, for having me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker for the 17th Kunti and Akwamu Lecture, Madam Idaya Tassan. Is that all you can do? You can do better, please. Thank you. Once again, thank you so much, Madam Idayat Hassan, for this wonderful lecture. I'd like to once again quickly acknowledge the presence of Dr. Esther Ofea Boadje, Chairperson, Star Ghana. Welcome. We also have Nana Kwejo Wusu in Suta Traditional Council. You're also welcome, ladies and gentlemen. At this point, let me welcome back to the podium our chairperson for this event to give us our closing remarks. Please. Thank you very much, Dayat. Um, in Ghana here, we've been priding ourselves as a beacon of democracy in Nigeria. And I found it very interesting, extremely intriguing, when Dayat uh, said that one of the exports that we have made with our democracy to Kano was one of the <clears throat> elements of the underbelly of our democracy. 
that is insults. Because he said people came here to study to be propaganda secretaries. And that, as far as I'm concerned, from the point of view of Media Foundation, is insults. Because she spoke about the closing space for voices. I will not be wrong in saying that that is one area that we are suffering. And it is because political party spokespersons, particularly on radio and on social media, have over the last couple of decades made it a point to ensure that whoever raises a voice that this party doesn't like, that this presidential candidate doesn't like, all these so-called serial callers will run down the person. And so the political parties have ensured that the space for critical expression is limited. But in the context of the issue Idayat has addressed, political parties are also quite a part of the problem. Because as far as I can observe around the continent, there are no more political parties that adhere to the ideological premises upon which they promised to rule. So a party is social democratic, a party is liberal democratic, but there's no difference. Not only really is there any difference between them, but these parties have stopped or do not play any role in the education of the public on these vital philosophies and ideologies of uh, democracy in, in politics. And so our political parties are also quite an issue for us to consider in how to uh, open the space for civic uh, life. Because again, an interesting observation about political parties across the continent is that even as the political parties are all showing all manner of signs of contributing to the closing of democracy, you rarely find voices of reform from within any of these political parties. And that is quite dangerous for political parties that become so monolithic that even within them, there's no reform-minded elements at the leadership level or even at the grassroots level. And so what kind of a democracy is it that within political parties there are no rigorous debates for the parties moving forward? Um, we thank you very much, Idayat, because you've done a good job giving us a, a, panoram a, a panoramic view, a historical view of the development of civil, civil society, civic, the civic space from the anti-colonial movement up to today. And you've raised a number of questions that require our reflection and, and, and continued discussion and debating how to improve uh, the situation we are in. Uh, the lecturer, the spe speaker has also raised some of the vital factors that are militating against the space that we all must fight in opening up. Um, there are those external factors, and those external factors become quite frightening when we have not even finished dealing with the old external factors who militate against democracy and many of our other issues, but new forces that are coming in. What does it mean for in our independence, for instance, as nations? That itself is a very critical question beyond political parties, beyond ethnicity, but our collective survival and existence as nations and, and countries. So these external factors are important for us to uh, look at. Um, another vital point that she raised was the failure of democracy to promote socioeconomic development. 
we've all had at some point very vibrant constitutional uh, governance at some point. But because the economies have not been able to deliver the people from the crassness of poverty that we all experience, they give vent to all manner of attractions to illiberal ideas, illiberal forces, and illiberal political agendas. So that is also an important issue that we must. Of course, we were all right in the late 80s coming on because we were all fighting against dictatorships, tyranny, one party, military dictatorships, and so on. Our attention was focused necessarily on the politics of democratization. But we have come to a state where the issues of social and economic content of democracy should be, become also a major a, a aspect of the agenda. What is even one of the more frightening elements that have shown up, of course, is the, as she puts it, the non-state armed groups parading uh, across the Sahel and threatening all of our, not just our democracy, but our very existence as we know it to be. These are issues that should lead to a sense of unity of our countries, but not only unity of our countries, but a stronger regional organization, a stronger regional attempt, a, a stronger cooperation among our governments to fight off these uh, uh, forces. Because again, the, the, the state in Africa has shown a major weakness in providing security for its own citizens. To the extent that when these ex existential threats come, we have to go back to France. Some have to go back to uh, Russia, and so on and so forth. In other words, so because we have failed to build strong states whose major and perhaps primary object is to protect the security of their systems, because we have failed in this, we have become, therefore, vulnerable to all manner of external interests and their machinations. Um, Idayat has given us a whole list of the elements that make up the closing of the space. Issues of press freedom, issues of insecurity, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are all, and when the movement for democratic reform started in the late 1980s into the 1990s, some of the more vibrant civil society organizations that emerged were the mo women's movement, building on the, uh, the, the, the Beijing 95 uh, conference, human rights organizations. Until then, apart from a couple of countries, such as Nigeria, which had one or two human rights organizations, you all remember that a lot of time, external non-governmental organizations like Amnesty International were the ones that were fighting uh, for human rights issues in our country. All of these organizations, organizations monitoring elections and promoting uh, transparency in elections, organizations fighting for, working for uh, good governance and so on, organizations working against corruption have all emerged. How do we fare nowadays? How do we all fare nowadays? It is a question that we should all be addressing ourselves. Um, so, we have had all these experiences, external factors, internal factors, affecting the viability, the capacity of civil society organizations. And it's important and very encouraging and rewarding that Idayat ended with a number of concerns pertaining to civil 
society organizations themselves. For instance, she raised the question of <clears throat> the, the challenge of legitimacy for civil society organizations, and we must take it very, very seriously because without legitimacy, uh, you are lost. She raised the issue of polarization. She raised the issue of building the next generation of civic actors, a very, very, very critical question of continuity and of keeping the civic space uh, uh, open because the next generation should certainly inherit the work that the earlier generation did. And it's important that she added that not just building new leaders, but building new leaders with a high ethical standards and, prof and professionalism in order to build an intergenerational gap. Um, she raised the role of ECOWAS. <clears throat> what I want to add to the role of ECOWAS is that, yes, Sule's remarks are apt, and we ought all to, be, uh, to, to, to take uh, ECOWAS to task for the duplicity. But I think there are a lot of things we can still do with ECOWAS in helping to open the civic space. For instance, using the ECOWAS court in the experience of the Media Foundation for West Africa and in the experiences of other civil society organizations has been very, very, very rewarding, especially in the fight against Jame uh, in the Gambia, in, the, in seeking justice for uh, some victims in Burkina Faso, Niger, and so on. And so we must strengthen our work and our relationships with ECOWAS and, and see how far we can move the space more widely open. So basically, I think that this has been a lot of food for thought. Uh, we await the paper, and I, I hope that the other civil society organizations here, IDEG and so on, will pick up the debate. Because we pick it up the debate, it's also part of the struggle to widen the space. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I'll remind you of um, a statement that uh, uh, an African-American civil rights organizer, Flo Kennedy, made some years back. She said that democracy is like taking a bath. You have to keep taking it every day. So we have to keep fighting to open the space. Without consistency, without persistence, Democracy, we all know, what we won was not on a silver plate. It was not a gift. It is the result of a fight. And that fight is back here again. We thought we had it and relaxed our guards. Now, we have to put on our new gears all over again and fight. Social media has its myriad of problems. But still, we can use that technology to our favor. So thank you very much, and thank Idayat for this wonderful presentation. Prof. Chair, thank you so much. Um, the final batch of um, recognitions and acknowledgments, Professor Akusia Dakwa, Dean, School of Communication Studies, thank you so much for being a part of this evening's program. Also, Professor Jima Bwedi, board chair, Afrobarometer, and co-founder of CDD Ghana. Thank you so much for being a part. So on behalf of the governing board, fellows, partners, staff, family, and friends of CDD Ghana and CDD Africa, thank you so much, distinguished guests, here in person, radio, TV, online, social media. Let the, con the conversation continue with the hashtag CronT22 and the hashtag open civic spaces and as we wrap up the 17th lecture i know that the 18th lecture is cooking already and many thanks to our sponsors stambic bank kpmg unique image bell aqua and of course the multimedia group joy news joy fm adum asempa amongst others myjoyonline.com hits fm and 
Uh, we'll see you at the Old Schools reunion this Saturday. And that's how we wrap up the 17th Cronti and Akwamu lecture for today. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Please do well to get yourself a copy of our previous publications and book a copy of the 17th lecture. It's outside our stands are there for you uh, to get the CDD publications. They're all available. All the 17th lectures, 17 lectures, all available outside. Please make sure you get a copy and let the discussion continue. Open our civic spaces now. Hashtag Cronty2022 and then hashtag Open Civic Spaces. I am MFA Apau. Thank you so much for being a part of this event. We'll close shortly with a, a brief prayer. We started with a prayer. Father Lord, we thank you for this wonderful event. We pray that you help us to continue to keep our civic spaces open in Jesus' name. Amen.